Well, for everyone watching, um, welcome. And thank you for joining us for this plenary on the critical roles of grassroots initiatives and communities in um, increasing the adoption of open science practices. My name is Emmy Tang. I'm the engagement lead at Invest in Open Infrastructure and a co-organizer of this conference. And I'm just really excited to be facilitating this panel today. So a little bit about um, our thinking behind this panel and what it's gonna cover. So the Year of Open Science celebrates the benefits and successes of open science and inspire more scientists to adopt open science practices. Um, earlier today and also later on in the conference, we'll be hearing more about how policies, technical infrastructures, uh, incentives, et cetera, are contributing to us these goals and to advancing open science. But we want to hold this space particularly to celebrate the important work of grassroots communities. Community-driven bottom-up initiatives play a really critical role in increasing the adoption of open science practices by bringing together more diverse perspectives and ideas and empowering individuals to actively um, drive and lead cultural change in their communities. They are also really pivotal to um, normalizing open science practices in research and scholarship and by creating and maintaining the scaffolds for the community members to exchange knowledge, to problem solve, and to learn together. I'm really, really excited to be joined by four amazing community leaders today. I am really inspired by their leadership and work in nurturing and cultivating communities in their respective domains. I'll be asking them to introduce themselves in a moment. And then after their introductions, um, I'll start, it off, start us off with some questions that the panelists will discuss. And then hopefully we will, um, with this discussion, we'll inspire additional questions and thoughts from y'all. Um, and in the final sort of 20 minutes or so of this session, we'll open the floor for your questions. So if you do have a question in the meantime, please do use the Q&A function in your Zoom windows uh, to ask them and we'll relay them to the panelists later on. So without further ado, um, Panelists, if we can go around the room and you can share with us who you are, um, where are you joining us from, the organization or initiative that you're representing today, and very briefly, how you got into open science grassroots community leadership and development. Um, that'd be fantastic. So if I could start maybe with Jacob. Sure. Um, good evening. I'm uh, Jacob Green from Hospital Plus Plus. Well, I'm normally in Baltimore, Maryland tonight. I'm uh, in the Netherlands. Um, how did I get into the this area? Uh, I'm a um, uh, background in in distributed systems and, and and complex systems, and very interested in the ideas of community and my own communities in, in Baltimore and uh, communities around the world, and how we might um, use the power of together to solve some of the societal's greater challenges. And um, it's been an interesting journey to get to get here. Thanks, Jacob. Nick? Uh, my name is Nick Halper. I'm from an organization called Neuromatch. I am normally in Salt Lake City, but tonight I'm in Switzerland. <laughs> um, I originally got into open science practices, I think, because of the field that I came from or come from. Uh, working in neuroscience, uh, it's easy to see how the field uh really kind of focuses on or could benefit from collaborative effort. You have this like single complex system that all these people are studying and they can study it in pieces or parts or they can combine their works basically and work together on it. Um, and so for me, it was like inherently this sort of um, collaborative, like open practices would be helpful in this field. And that's been demonstrated through other sort of top-down initiatives, whether it be the Global Brain Initiative or other things like that. And so um, I really think it was sort of my field and background that brought me into it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Brie. Um, yeah, thanks, Emmy. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brianna, but most people just call me Brie. Um, I'm the community coordinator for the gathering for open science hardware community, but we usually just call it the GOSH community because that's our acronym and it's nice and short and easy. Um, I am calling in from Melbourne, Australia today. So it's about 530 in the morning. So I'm a little bit sleepy, but Definitely really excited to be here and chat with all of you. And just a bit of history on how I kind of got involved in this stuff. Um, back in university, when I was an undergraduate student, I worked a lot with a citizen science student organization. 
Um, and we were really, you know, trying to better figure out how um, we can use research to advocate for ourselves as undergraduate students. And um, from there, I really started thinking a lot more about public participation in science. And this led me down the course to get more involved in open science stuff and inevitably working with open source hardware, which has been really fun and really cool. And I don't have an engineering background, but I've learned so much from this community and it's been really fun. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Danielle. Thank you. Um, my name is Daniela Faderi, um, and I'm the co-founder and director of Pre-Review, and I am sick, so part of my voice, and I might be coughing here and there um, today. I am calling from Portland, Oregon in the United States, but um, I am originally, I was born and grew up in Italy, and my uh, past, uh, my background, I guess, is not my past, but it's still very much a present sometimes, but it's in neuroscience, and it kind of like what I came to the US uh, for doing a PhD um, in neuroscience and I really wanted to continue. I was very passionate. I always wanted to be a researcher in academia. But um, in 2016, I had the opportunity to uh, attend OpenCon, um, which uh, was a wonderful conference that I still wish that it came back uh, to us and it exposed me as a kind of an early career researcher to an incredible, diverse and global community of uh, practitioners or researchers like lots of librarians that I just uh, really learned how to love um, uh, and I didn't, know, I didn't know librarians at the time so it really opened up uh, a community of people passionate about catalyzing change in the space of science and so I saw like, a lot of possibility to <clears throat> improve and, and do real transformative change in the field that I loved and uh, when I came back um, I really wanted to to do something about it. And so I just learned about preprints and it really, I was really intrigued about the idea of an opportunity to provide um, comments to preprints and kind of transform the journal clubs that we were doing in my department from a let's show how smart we all are and why these papers should have not been published in cell or nurture, nurture or, and you know, to actually let's have a constructive discussion and provide feedback at a point in time in which still matters. And that was really kind of like the spark that kind of generated uh, um, you know, the, the idea behind pre-review and then um, kind of uh, growing the organization with uh, the rest of the team has been uh, wonderful. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be with you all. Thank you so much. And uh, do, do take water, please. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for introducing yourselves and a little bit the journey that you took to get here, um, because this session is all about humans and, and our, our motivations and stories. So I'm um, going to start off with our first question. Um, want to know a little bit more about the work that you do within your initiatives and organizations. How does your uh, respective initiatives um, empower researchers to embrace and champion open science principles? Um, maybe, uh, Bree, we'll start with you. Awesome, yeah. So I, as I said before, I work with the GOSH community um, or the Gathering for Open Science Hardware community, but I'm just gonna use GOSH for now because it's it's easier. Um, and we're focused on increasing the adoption of open science hardware. And so we're really concerned with any tools or instruments that are being used for science. And so I like to think of microscopes, environmental sensors, um, but also things like biological reagents as well. Um, and we really want to make these tools and these instruments open source. Um, and I think in order to understand what open source hardware is, we kind of have to talk about closed source or proprietary hardware first. Um, so proprietary hardware, it creates what we call black boxes. And these are technologies that we can't understand because quite literally we can't open them up. And so we don't understand how these devices are being built. Uh, we can't fix these devices if they break. And we also can't modify these devices either. Um, and the sort of closed nature of these devices, it inhibits what we can do because proprietary hardware is also often really expensive. It leads to a highly concentrated market. Um, it causes vendor lock-in and it really limits how rapidly we can reproduce devices. Um, but on the other hand, open source hardware, it really opens up 
this box that I just described. And when I say that a piece of hardware is open source or open, I'm really just talking about the design files and the schematics of this actual device um, being shared using an open license. So open science hardware, then we're just taking this concept and just applying it to scientific instruments and the impact that it can have on research and grassroots communities is really big because now anyone can use, study, modify, sell um, these devices. And it just comes with a bunch of benefits like furthering innovation, lowering costs, and also importantly, tearing down barriers to access. Um, so in all of this, I know I just described what open source hardware was for a little bit, but the GOSH community, our purpose in all of this is really to act as a network and a convening space where anyone who's contributing to open science hardware, whether they be engineers, researchers, policymakers, artists, whoever, um, they can come together and collaborate on projects and advocate for open science hardware. Um, and my last thought here is I, I really view open science hardware as this mechanism for real and also meaningful collaboration between a whole kaleidoscope of people and communities from all across the world. So, yeah. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Daniela, do you want to go next? Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, I guess I'll start with the, pre the mission. So as it's growing from the idea of like, let's discuss for print and journal club and provide feedback, uh, working together with the two other um, uh, former researchers, Samantha Hindle and Monica Granados, we really thought like, what is the opportunity here? Um, and we, we decided that there was, um, that the mission really needed to be around uh, bringing an, a more equity and openness to the scholarly peer review process. So um, the, and particularly, so we focus on peer review and specifically on preprint reviews because preprints give us um, as a community the opportunity to kind of shift away from that opaque and transactional um, and very often elite, uh, elite and exclusionary practices of research evaluation and move towards a more transparent um, and kinder and more inclusive and collaborative practice of improving um, each other's work. And, and I also think that this adds the component of getting kind of back the power into the researchers of how do we uh, share and evaluate um, each other's works and how do we are, are recognized for that labor. Um, we uh, work in close collaborations with individuals and also with um, uh, other with organizations to develop tools and resources that are open science and open, uh, sorry, open access and open source um, to um, enable uh, preprint review uh, for all. So we, um, our platform, on our platform we review, uh, anyone with an ORCID ID can uh, review a preprint uh, from 22 growing number, a growing number of preprint servers. We are preprint server agnostic. So as long as the preprint is a digital, digital object identifier, it can be reviewed on, pre, on pre-review. And uh, these reviews themselves get um, a DOI. And so uh, they become part of the scholarly record. And as of uh, recently, we also are able to um, uh, have the reviews um, appear on the profile, the ORCID profile of the uh, reviewers as they decide to review publicly. So the way that we try to empower uh, researchers um, in, in this process is by both providing these um, kind of ways for them to get recognition if they wish to do so. There are also ways to stay, to remain anonymous in a secure way of respecting community values. Uh, but we also provide uh, resources and um, we try at least to provide resources and value with uh, training programs, with opportunities to share and collaborate um, with other uh, researchers in their field or the audition field. Um, so our trainings um, focus on understanding how um, op kind of structural and societal oppression uh, in different uh, spaces affects the peer review process uh, all the way from the personal to the systemic level. And so really understanding what can we do as individual, but um, in the time, when a time in which we're sitting down and reviewing a preprint to mitigate the effects of our personal beliefs that have come from being where we are in, in the world. 
and uh, all the way to how can we as people embedded in a, in a system and an institution um, affect change, uh, positive change in peer review with, through policy, through um, um, kind of conversations with other and experience sharing. Uh, so those trainings are really powerful and like kind of my, one of my favorite parts of my job, just interacting with other researchers. And then uh, obviously the scalability of that is um, uh, is not as, um, I guess, like a, as immediate if we were just the only one providing training. So we've been focusing only always on sharing the resources and empowering others to deliver their own training. So right now we're going through a, a program of uh, champions where we are um, uh, working with 20 amazing community members that will be uh, championing their work and bringing this um, adaptation of our work to their own communities. So um, yeah, I hope that, that covers all the questions. Thanks so much, Daniela. Uh, Nick. Yeah. Um, so Neuromatch as an organization uh, really focuses on coordinating people together to collaboratively build educational materials, uh, as well as basically uh, research experiences. And I'll kind of talk through both of those quickly. But our, our focus has really been to bring together uh, academic and industry researchers, as well as graduate level educators to collaboratively build these open educational workbooks. And then we leverage those in a few different ways. Um, they're allowed to be, or they basically are, redistributed out and used in classrooms all around the world. And then we also leverage them in our own training program so that students can come in and, and learn from these uh, with live instruction, people following these like open source and collaboratively built materials. And so I, I would say that uh, kind of coming to the root of your question, like how do we demonstrate open science practices or how are they sort of like fundamental to what we do? Um, they really were built in and baked into the organization in how it was formed. That method of collaboratively building things and posting all of these uh, open materials on GitHub or OSF and making them freely accessible um, and allowing people to basically um, change all these little like modular pieces of what a course or a workbook or a set of open educational resources looks like um, really was a sort of different way uh, to do education. It was bringing a lot of these open science practices into uh, education and learning materials. And so um, that like spirit of open science has really kind of like flowed through the organization uh, into everything that we do. Uh, the data sets that we use in our courses all have to be uh, open access and easily accessible. Um, we, as we clean up those data sets, we host them on OSF and make them uh, easily findable and usable. Uh, and then as we're actually teaching these courses, because of the people who are involved in the practice that we have, uh, we tend to reinforce these open science practices as well. As students publish micro publications as a result of their research experiences, we make those all open access, et cetera. And so it, I think we're, by building it into how we operate, we've been able to kind of build it into how we teach. And the people that come out of our programs, I think tend to be much more open science oriented. Uh, as they go on and participate in the community. Thank you so much, Nick. That's really interesting. Um, Jacob. Hi there. Um, um, so as I said, my name is Jacob Green, and I'm, uh, I've been working at OSPO++. It's an initiative to basically take the concept of open source, the large, broad community of open source, and see if we can't institutionalize open source into basically the offices of open source. It's a interesting uh, way to think about building new offices like the office of the CTO, but it's the office of software. And to go beyond the software, to think of open source as both a noun in terms of the license, the IP, et cetera, into the verb, which is community collaboration, et cetera, to enable and um, install the culture of that collaboration into the office itself so that we have a greenfield situation to create offices at universities, at governments, at NGOs, in an industry that are enabled with a culture of collaboration and empowered with the, the tools through the medium of open data, open source, open science, open access, in order to enable those collaborations. 
it's an it's an interesting way of thinking about building digital infrastructure in terms of it actually being the offices of um, at, at various di different institutions. We've had some success. It's been a, lo a lot of learnings. We're basically at the very nascent stages of this. Um, various different groups are experimenting in, in this in this area. Um, but there's a um, we, we held a an event at the United Nations last June to start thinking about what it would take to design and build cooperative digital infrastructure that can be impactful. And that's the, the real word, word I wanna stress to the open science researchers in the audience, et cetera. We struggle a lot of times with the idea of how to have higher education and, and, and the research community have large scale impact. And I, th I think we all are, are speaking a very common language in terms of cooperation about how, how to get there. For me, the exciting part in this is the prospects of being able to have large-scale impact, not just through the cooperation of individuals, but through the harnessing and the cooperation of institutions through multiple different sectors around the globe. So we might start thinking a little bit more holistically how we can have large quantum leaps in impact um, going forward. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, I've, I, and perhaps not surprised, but but very um, inspired by the sort of resonance that we're hearing in terms of the the work that you all are trying to to enable um, and to increase the work that you're all doing to increase the adoption of open science practices and principles in your communities. Um, you know, we talked about I, Jacob. I love what you said about you know open as a verb, and that's really you know emphasizing the fact that openness is practiced through well practice, right? It's like it, we, it needs to be continually facilitated, continually um, uh, executed and, and iterated over, and to um, and that's only possible with people, right? Bree, you mentioned your gosh's role in bringing together a kaleidoscope of people, and that I, I think that's also very beautiful to to think of think of the roles of communities in in that sense. Um, and so, so I think, yeah, we're we're what we're seeing. And hopefully the audience are with us at the moment is that you know communities really are playing a critical role critical role is in not only enabling the practice of open and in and reinforcing it but also in um cultivating that cultural change and and embedding these practices within the day-to-day -day of our operations within and beyond what we do within research and community building um so uh, that brings me nicely to uh, the the sort of second aspect that I'd love to get your your thoughts on here. Um, in terms of in your experiences working with and uh, building with your communities, um, what perspectives and solution do you think grassroots communities uniquely bring to the forefront of open science discourse? And if we can start with uh, Daniela. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, do my best. Um, yeah, so this is a great question. And I, um, you know, the, the definition of grassroots itself, so grassroots sort of movement and organizations, is this uh, beautiful way of using kind of collective action that uh, within their local community and then use that to implement change that ripples from local, regional, national, and, and global levels. And so I, this idea of, um, you know, I guess for preview itself, like that preview was founded by uh, three early career researchers and women uh, that were uh, scientists still on the bench and saw um, in preprints and in open science and open scholarship more in general, this kind of um, irresistible opportunity to change the aspects of science and academia that we saw coming over and over in the way um, between what we're doing and our dream uh, of what science, being a scientist and research could be. And that was so irresistible that kind of moved all three of us away from that track and really thinking about what are the, the, the things that we could do together um, with the community to kind of change these aspects. And the um, 
the the beauty I think of grassroots work is that and and, and the challenge as well because now I think like now if I think about when was I last a researcher that was concerned about publishing that was concerned about you know my uh, creating a, a portfolio for my um, next job in academia um, it's been a while so I think that the opportunity and the challenge is that you the opportunity is that you can continue to learn um, if you continue to stay embedded in the community you learn from the people that actually need uh have needs and, and experiences that can inform you of how to best make the change um, and therefore you can enable transformative change long-lasting change in a much better way than working from up here distanciating yourself from um you know who the community are impacted are uh, but the challenge is that again now you know in our team specifically like you now we, we don't have uh, active researchers in our core team but the that challenge is being met with, I think, a beautiful way of uh, allocating resources and time to beautiful. There's always going to be better ways to do it, but we really tried hard to create opportunities for research communities uh, to uh, interact and in, uh, give provide input uh, to our work, uh, feedback to our work, and we try to make these opportunities kind of reward this opportunity with um, uh, funding if we can. Uh, but really kind of involving the community in in shaping the roadmap, in shaping what the future of, of what we're doing is. So I think that. Um, if uh, you know, some people ask, like, how are you ever gonna scale some of the things that you're doing? And it's like maybe some of those things actually don't need scaling. Some of those things could need to continue, like the kind of um, attending of like communities that can kind of grow within their own. And so the way how it scales, maybe that's again the answer is like through um, decentralized care. And and that's really what like the um, the dream that I have for pre review is is just like this. Um, you know, these are the tools, these are some of the values that, that we have, that you share, and what can you add to it, and how can you shift it uh, in a way that kind of best serves the, the needs of the community that you're in. And the last thing that I want to say is that when they say researchers, it's actually something that most recently I have been, we have been questioning in terms of who, you know, we always question who is an expert, who decides who is a good peer reviewer uh, versus who is not. And, and a lot of those kind of proxy for expertise are things that we want to fight against. So like prestige, name, uh, so a recognition in, in a more kind of um, elite way in academia. And we want to like think about more about growing like that expertise around dedication to contribution to proper interviews. And we have been in contact and we're beginning conversations with uh, patients groups so that are actually very interested in getting involved in providing feedback to research. And so I'm, and again, this is very preliminary, but I'm really excited about um, next time this year, exploring better ways of like, how can even these groups, groups of patients that are not researchers, right? But they have expertise, they have years of expertise. In fact, they have reached out personally to me, uh, some of them to ask, like, can I review on your platform? The answer is yes, but we don't have like an actual dedicated way to think about what are their needs, what are some of their concerns to engage in this uh, space. So really thinking about peer review and opening up this idea of who are the grassroots communities that we are um, trying to um, support. Thanks. Thanks, Daniela. I love the point you brought up around, you know, communities, grassroots initiatives, roles of sort of questioning the status quo and assumption of who's included in conversation, whose, whose voices are being heard and bringing in additional folks who, who are not at the moment at the table. Um, that's really, really important. Jacob. He's actually frozen. <laughs> uh, internet and infrastructure sometimes. Well, if if uh, grassroots uh, efforts, I think we bring an amazing. Oh, Jacob, your internet is breaking up a little. Uh, going to see you. All right, I think I think. Um, how about Jacob? If we can come back to you in a second. Um, oh, can you hear us? I can. Okay, okay, you're back. You're back for us. <laughs> Let's Perfect. see how this goes. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. 
uh, grassroots efforts, I think, have an uh, amazing power and an amazing uh, perspective on things. Being able to have an outsider's view uh, on some of, of the research and ways to get things done, I think, is uh, invaluable. I also think a lot of times grassroots efforts can be ephemeral. They don't have to always look for long-term sustainability options, and that gives them a unique uh, uh, a tool in being able to, to stand up, to get something accomplished, and then shut down. Um, there are a number of public policy interests uh, that come to mind that I think grassroots efforts are more tapped into. And so bringing that knowledge and bringing that directly to, to, to researchers in, in a fast track kind of way, even before uh, the grant makers are aware of it, ha has, has a, a extreme potential. Uh, I think, um, furthermore, in terms of uh, the, the ability to have impact, I'm going to drive that, that, that thing home again and, and again. I think a lot of grassroots um, efforts are uniquely positioned to uh, challenge researchers to, to try to get more impact and to think about new and inventive ways to, to help to uh, achieve uh, some of that, that impact. I really uh, think of the grassroots and, and, and uh, the institutions and, and uh, researchers as a, bi as a bidirectional uh, interface uh, that um, uh, a lot of culture can be passed and a lot of priority can be passed um, uh, down that thing. At the end of the day, open science is a process, as we've said, of people. And so getting people more in contact with community, with, with grassroots efforts uh, is uh, um, empowering on, on all sides. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love that idea of, of communities, grassroots initiatives being that interface between researchers or others um, uh, sort of from the bottom up. And uh, we'd, we'd love to explore that further in, in our next question as well, in terms of, you know, how that bridges between, how grassroots play a role with, uh, in bridging between, you know, the, the researchers and, and outside communities to, you know, the perhaps, you know, leadership and, and federal agencies, governments, et cetera. Um, Bree, if you could share a little bit here, we'd love to hear. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do. So going back to kind of what Daniela was saying um, regarding redefining what constitutes a researcher, I found that really interesting. And I just wanted to raise that up really quick um, because I, I do feel an important case um, that could also be made here is that more people can and should be involved in co-creating knowledge. And I think grassroots communities have shown that there is an immense amount of ways that research can be done and can happen. Um, and furthermore, people that have local knowledge can contribute not only just data, but also ideas, hardware design, software code, um, whatever, really, to a knowledge commons that anyone can access. And um, similar as well to what Jacob was saying, I really think um, it's important to view this flow of information and resources as being multidirectional as well. And so communities that are using open science hardware have been really pushing innovation and coming up with solutions that have a collective impact, not even within their respective communities, but in, across the entire globe. Um, and they're creating hardware that meets local needs, but also becomes scalable and responsive at the same time. And I think there's a lot of excellent examples we can pull from of grassroots communities using open science hardware. And when I think in the uh, space of collecting environmental data, um, and even sometimes collecting this data in times of environmental crisis. I think of Public Lab in the United States, um, but there's also grassroots communities that are using open source technologies to share knowledge related to sustainable agricultural practices. Um, the Open Agroecology Lab in Argentina is doing exactly this. Um, and even in space science as well, we have university students that are creating open source cube satellites. Um, and these satellites are low cost and it enables students to carry out research outside of, you know, more well-resourced institutions. And so I think my, um, my closing thoughts would be that these communities are really changing how we approach science and the collaborative way in which we are creating and sharing these devices it really redefines how we participate in scientific research um, and also knowledge creation, and it makes the practice more communal. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
the examples that you gave are so powerful in illustrating how, you know, grassroots initiatives can, you know, really allow us to that, that space to test out alternative approaches to how we could typically consider, you know, research and science to be done. And again, challenging some of that assumption, but also bring in new perspectives and practices into into this, re which really ultimately benefits, you know, not only have re research, the research ecosystem, but also the whole world, hopefully. <laughs> Nick. Yeah, I, I think so much, uh, so many good things have been said already about uh, this being a way to have people who are affected um, by the changes or by the work products be there to actually do the work and influence how it's done, I think is really important. Um, I think the, the new thing I'll try to add to this, uh, to add on to these, is uh, sort of the other function of community, or rather the types of communities that can form in these grassroots initiatives. Sometimes when we, you know, every, every one of us is part of many different types of communities. Communities. Uh, we might be part of the neuroscience community, or we might be part of the Harvard researchers community. We might be part of uh, the community in Southern California. And there's there's this geographic, and there's these workplace, and there's these domain boundaries. Uh, but when you add on these grassroots initiatives, you get these um, interest boundaries, or these sort of like belief boundaries, where people are bonding with each other. So now you get a group of people who believe that preprints and reviewing preprints is an important way to influence how science is done and rigor of science and things like that. You get people who are like solving hard problems in open source hardware and like what that actually looks like. These are like really interesting communities to form and they inherently cut across all those other communities that we saw. And so I think the, the term grassroots is really nice um, and again, kind of self-defining here to say like, there are all these little seeds basically that you're planting into all these other communities now uh, where you're like giving root to these open science practices and principles and you're showing these people in these other communities uh, what that can look like and how it can work. Um, so inherently there's this like recruitment aspect and this like demonstration and example aspect. Um, and so I think in some ways that that, that community is really valuable. And then on the sort of flip side of it is there's this um, community of practice element where it's like, oh, great. Uh, now uh, it might be hard to force yourself to publish open access papers only when you're sitting there alone at Harvard doing it. But when you're doing it with a bunch of other people who also do that, because that's the community you've bonded with, it's much easier to practice that. And you can see ways of practicing it. Um, and so you have that community support, uh, which has been so demonstrated, like it's been demonstrated so well. Um, how valuable that is in causing people to persist uh, in some of these like good efforts. Fantastic. Yeah, that is such such an important element of being being in part of community is just the amount of, you know, even even if just not feeling alone, right? Sometimes change is hard and it's it just makes it that much easier to be able to do it and and tr and troubleshoot it and discuss it with other people and to be able to persist. Um, so switching gears a little bit, we've talked quite a bit about you know what what grassroots uh, initiatives and communities are bringing to to open science and the the diverse perspectives, um, not only but also the support element, the sort of ability to um, be be focusing on and exploring different ways to ensure that the the research and science is being done in, in centering the needs of communities all around the world. Um, what about in terms of, you know, complementing some of the sort of more top-down, if you will, institutional efforts in terms of uh, promote the, the promotion of open science? Because we do know that they are important. We are, again, going to talk about a lot of them and already have talked about quite a few of them um, during this conference. So um, how do we see, yeah, grassroots being able to complement these sort of more top-down efforts in, in the promotion of open science? And I'm also going to slot in uh, the, the, the question that we have from the audience here as well is, how would you um, characterize the impact of institutional rewards-based initiatives on the adoption of open sciences? How, do, how does that relate to, you know, maybe some of the, the, the work and participation that you have from your community members. Um, I'm going to start with Jacob. Let me take the question in terms of uh, how does a grassroots effort com complement uh, institutions? And I think the 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 
evolution of OSPOs has is an interesting case study to to see uh, community based um, requests for an institutional interface align with an institution's needs for figuring out how to do open science, open source, et cetera, to, to create an office where both grassroots and community have requested this and the institution helps to, 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 to build it. Century uh, journey in terms of uh, with uh, cities, particularly to look at what and how some of the um, the the universities we're not there yet in terms in terms in any stretch of the imagination, but we're starting to have the conversation. We're starting to explore what what might uh, be be available, what, what might be possible. Uh, we started out with a uh, a thought experiment of building an OSPO um, at, with the city of Paris and at a university in the U.S. at Johns Hopkins, and and trying to uh, take code from the city of Paris and deploy it to communities in Baltimore via the help of the university interface um, as a kind of a, a pilot of two nodes of a network. We're making the first phone call for cooperation through it and, and seeing how um, uh, we might work together to complement each other and that interface, that institutionality that both sides want um, can be expressed. Yeah, that is a very intriguing model indeed. Um, and we'd love to love to learn more about, you know, what you're learning in that process and 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 uh and yeah, to you know pay attention to to his progress as well. Uh Bree, I wonder if you, you can add on to here. Yeah, sure. Um so speaking from the perspective of a community organizer, I, I think it's really important how all of these efforts are in conversation with one another. Um, like I said before, GOSH is a convening space where people from different disciplines, domains, and regions are coming to work together. Um, an example that I can think of was in 2017 when we gathered as a community in Chile, um, we began working on the GOSH roadmap. And um, I want you to picture this room that is full of researchers, organizers, artists, policymakers, anyone you can think of, this large room filled with people. And they're just sitting around at tables, sharing ideas with each other, throwing sticky notes of ideas onto a wall, and just eventually coming to a consensus together on what would become our most impactful document as a community. Um, and that was our roadmap. And so this document, which outlines the actions we need to take to make open science hardware ubiquitous, it was authored by a hundred different people in the end um, because of the sort of process that was taking place to do that. And I mentioned this example because I think it's it's a really good example of how important it is the way that we hold space for these conversations to happen. Um, and I think when we're working with something like open science hardware, it's especially important because these tools are increasing access um, to, to the technologies we need to do science. And it leads to solutions that could be co-created between users, developers, and researchers. And yeah, I think it's super important to support community-based initiatives alongside institutional ones, um, because when grassroots communities are creating open source and low cost tools, this also benefits researchers that are in institutions as well and vice versa. Um, and one thing I've thought a lot about is the fact that it's really this collaborative approach that comes along with open science hardware that leads to change rather than the nature of the technology itself. Um, so I did think about that quite a bit. And I think the question in the chat, I, I'll see if I can pull it up again, but it was around rewards and incentives. And I just wanted to add a quick comment that I thought of, um, and there's been a lot of research done in the open source hardware space that has shown that open source hardware has like huge cost savings and a really high return on investment. Um, and we view that as a really strong incentive for different um, funding bodies, federal agencies and universities to really be incentivized to use open science hardware. Um, so that was just my comment on that question and thank you. 
Thank you so much for that particular perspective as well. Like it's really, yeah. If only we can make these arguments, you know, louder and more clear to to those who are, you know, budget holders and managing budgets at institutions and at at funders as well. You know, um, it 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 does sound like you know it's it's a very valuable thing to not only invest in um, from from the standpoint of you know cultivating an open culture, but also from a very economic you know standpoint. Um, Nick. Yeah, um, I think this question, I'll answer this question in a sort of biased way, uh, because I believe, I, I sort of believe in this idea of like grassroots to treetops initiatives, like, I feel like I think things are most successful when they start out in grassroots form. And then top down policymakers can like identify those things that were successful, because they get to see the practices in action, and then can like implement top down policies uh, on them. Uh that said, I think one of the ways these things can uh, work to complement each other is through like incentive alignment. Um, I think both sides, when they're implementing policies, they're demonstrating um, how they're trying to like change or manipulate incentives. And so more communication and more openness about what those incentives are and how to get them to sort of align between what top down uh, kind of like methods the top down policymakers are using and what uh, sort of variables basically grassroots uh, communities are trying to influence would make them both more effective. And so I think uh, when we talk about complementary work, uh, I think that's one kind of important or important thing to consider or do. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, that if it's every, both the top down players and, and the grassroots communities have different strengths that, you know, together seems to be able to enable them to sort of collaborate and utilize each each of their uh, respective, you know, resources and, and powers in the best ways possible to, to really advance, you know, what essentially is a shared vision in many cases, right? Mm -hmm. um, Danny, Daniela. Yeah, that works great. Um, yeah, I before I answer the question, I just want to really highlight uh, a lot of things that uh, what Bree said, but others is just this idea of you know we're all working in our with our problem, quote unquote, right? And then like the the problem solution, like peer review software, um, but it's like the I think that what's beautiful and it's been said already, but I kind of want to like highlight it again is that we're be, beyond this. What we're trying to do. It's like this kind of cultural change and in like the change in like towards, and it's been said already beautifully also by Jacob, but this idea of like really incentivizing collaboration as a practice. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, not everybody has to collaborate always to do things, but like this idea of like a, um, understanding that it, it, individualism uh, doesn't always get us where we, we want to be even in the context of academia and I'm thinking particularly about like my own experience but I was always told that by being by myself was going to reward me more um, and I hope that together from grassroots and top down we can work towards really valuing this and, and having that valued in practice in um, in policy changes um, anyway that I don't know if that made any sense but it was just like something was forming in my head but for these questions particularly I'm thinking about the um the preprints so the space when i uh, in 2016 learned about preprints for the first time i think as a bio had just had come together like to maybe a couple of years before i don't remember exactly what was funded but specifically in the biological sciences preprints were really not known and what um seemed to have really changed the um the adoption was when preprints started to be recognized as a valuable output, a research output in biosketches. So I think NIH, and I don't remember exactly when that happened. I should review my Easter, maybe it was 2014. But um, uh, I think that grassroots organizations really provide, um, is again, like example and uh, attending to the community. Uh, and then having that matched by uh, policy that at least recommends or recognizes that work, it really makes a huge difference. I, for example, at Freedom View, we don't do uh, we don't do this work because 
you know, someone can um, go and show off that they have 25 uh, reviews and therefore they're better than others, right? But we do want to provide a way so that someone wants to be recognized for their work, they can. So we do put work into making sure our infrastructure is um, uh, connected with other key infrastructure in the space, that there are persistent identifiers. We do all of, we try to do all of the work and the metadata is there in order to be searched. So that if policymakers maybe, you know, in five years are going to say, no, I actually am going to uh, evaluate uh, or at least consider positively the fact that you have uh, contributed to open blueprint review, that you have put your time and expertise into trying to constructively help someone else work. And of course, now um, you know, everybody says like, we do have constructiveness policy like on pre-review, but like, I think it's, it's just, it's more, than just making another line on the CV for us. It's more about creating these kind of practices of collaboration and kindness that then can be spread to software, to any other practice in science. But then if there is a level of recognition that can be right there when the policy change happens, is definitely key. So I think that we need to work together on kind of, uh, and continue to work together on understanding what are the things that the policymakers are going to need in order to actually say, I'm going to recognize that that effort is being done. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that. I think, yeah, definitely there needs to be this, you know, there is value in having these conversations between both the sort of from the grassroots initiatives to the policymakers, but all the other way around in terms of striking that shared understanding of, you know, what are some of the, um, what are some of the needs that we're seeing from, you know, the grassroots communities based on, you know, the, their community work, but then also joining that with, you know, how the sort of top down policy or funding, uh, even from an infrastructure angle, right, um, where this could be facilitated and just made easier for people to sort of either be recognized more for their contributions in, in a more open manner um, or, or in other ways. Um, incentivized to, to practice more open. Um, fantastic. Uh, again, switching gears a little bit, uh, one thing to find out more about, you know, your experience and learn from your experience in terms of leading communities and, de and helping develop these communities, because that is a lot of work. <laughs> um, what are some of the main challenges that you see uh, facing grassroots open science communities in particular and how in your experience have they been, or can they be addressed? Uh, Nick, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I I think one of the the main challenges is this um, sort of like fractaling, like this this splitting apart, where basically you get all these different groups or efforts who are maybe focusing on trying to solve the same challenge or same thing. And in some cases, that's valuable because you get to see a lot of different attempts or tries or methods of trying to solve a problem. But in some cases, you end up in the situation where there's a little bit of like incentive to be the like starter or initiator or owner of that new thing. And so you end up with all these communities who are basically trying to solve a similar problem in a similar way, but they're competing for resources or they're um, operating differently. And I, in my experience, or I think one of the things where Neuromatch, for example, has had success is by providing a sort of like house or way for these people to work with each other and contribute their efforts to be like centrally recognized in, in one place, um, but not trying to declare ownership of that really ourselves, but allowing that to just the contributors own their work and they're bringing them to this, uh, to this community is, is a way to help with that. I think another one is is focusing on inter interoperability. And I mean this both in the sort of like typical software sense, like my software needs to work with your software, um, but also just making work products and outputs that can be easily used and adopted by others or correctly sort of like feed into the pipeline um, or, or what you might, what pathway, I guess you would call it, of resources that are already out there. And so, for example, I think it's really easy or tempting and you kind of see this, this happen for a lot of nonprofits or initiatives or movements in general is their scope just gradually creeps because they kind of want to own more and more of that like thing of the problem they're trying to solve. And I think a lot of groups would be a lot more effective, but they could say, I specialize in this and I'm going to refer you to this next thing or this next organization or this next tool uh, for the service they offer. And th there's various levels of success or practice of that in the 
the broad open science community. Um, but I think that's one of the challenges. And I think we're seeing people begin to be able to solve that better now. And I think there's a lot of learnings to take from open software and doing so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that is such a, a crucial point there in terms of, you know, how do we almost create a, a network within these different communities, a community of communities, if you will, right, um, to be able to support each other on a community scale um, and to be able to, you know, say, you know, maybe someone else can help you with this um, and to to sort of sustain each other that way. Um, also, also reminds me of I think Jacob's earlier point about whether or not communities needs to be sustained forever, um, yeah. and, and that itself is a is a really interesting question. Um, Daniela, if we can go to you next. Um, I was going to talk about interoperability but because it's been already said. I'm going to skip that part. Uh, however, I do I do really like that idea, and I want to I, I think this I I, I look for um, a, a space in which we can. Uh, do interoperative work within uh, this grassroots organization with shared values, um, but definitely a challenge that I have right now is <laughs> sustainability of the of the of the of the work or the, of the team and organization. Uh, so it's um, it's been interesting how um, you know without having any training basically in go into fundraising, um, I kind of somehow it worked uh, that and there were some funders interested in the work uh, that we were doing and and we got this model where. Um, you know, we uh, went out, uh, wrote a grant and, you know, got funded for a year or two. And then it's like, again, so this kind of problem sustainability. And maybe we, it's true, like if the problem is solved, we don't need to live forever. But it's in order to continue the, the work that we're doing, because we are seeing a growing impact, uh, we do need a better sustainability model. And I think that we also own it to the fact that we value shared power. And so just having a model that uniquely poses one funder into, you know, to hold them the power for one or two years, I mean, it's great, um, but it's also not really in line with, with our values, what we're trying to do. So I think trying to figure out um, uh, models that are more, um, that allow also other organizations and communities to contribute in the way that they can, um, and identifying what are the shared opportunities that those, you know, that that contribution can give. So what are things that we can offer um, in, not just in exchange, because it's like a, this is a transactional thing, but it's like, these are some of the values and the, the work that we're doing. And, and this is an opportunity for you to contribute. And also an opportunity for us to create a more close collaboration and understanding what are the shared goals. And what we were saying before, the question before, like aligning those values for, so that incentives kind of align more with the work that we're doing. So I really think this, uh, and hope that this is going to move into the direction. And for that, um, we're actually going to launch an, an organizational membership model, and we're going to have a design uh, sprint where all organizations are welcome to come and help us figure out what what does a model like that could look like for an organization like Print Review. So I'm really excited about um, getting that out. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, there there is, yeah, I, I love your thinking around, you know, how we can enable, like build pathways for people to contribute, right? And, and again, this is something that very, is very, you know, almost like we th we spent a lot of time thinking about that as community organizers, but also thinking about how do we enable other communities to come in and work on something together to to some a goal that is shared, so that we do each have you know value that we can gain out of this in, in this partnership, and then on the way figure out sort of that interoperability element as well. Perhaps like I mean, I hope that the funders in in, in the audience is paying attention and thinking thinking with us about how we can um you know help uh, not only strategize, but also resource that moving forward. Jacob. Could you repeat the question, Evie, for a second? Absolutely, yes, been a while. <laughs> um, so wondering what are some of the main challenges that you think are facing um, grassroots open science communities and in, in your experience, how they can be addressed? Sure, the incentive structures. Uh, had, a, had a lot of challenges working with institutions in terms of aligning, especially in academia, aligning the incentive structures to cooperate. I know the we've had recent uh, 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 commissions looking at how to in encourage open science and the incentive structures for that. I think to get to the verb of open science and to get to that cooperation, 
it's going to take another round of incentive structures and looking at to enable that cooperation to occur. A lot of the researchers I'm, uh, I've talked to, you know, they love the idea of cooperation, but at the end of the day, there are certain incentive structures that are are not always allowing them to 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 do that, even if they want to. Um, and so, really looking at those incentive structures to how to cooperate with communities outside of your organization, outside of your field, between institutions. Um, is, is one of the greatest challenges and I think one of the, the areas where we can have the most impact uh, in, in that area. To that end, um, the idea, I think, of thinking about the, the culture shift that I like to try to introduce here is the idea of neighbors. To think about the physical locality of which researchers exist in it is not just within the you know the their, their scientific communities, but to also think about the, the 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 physical community that they that they exist in, to understand that from a, a neighbor perspective in terms of that bidirectionality of trying to help neighbor to neighbor, it kind of brings it down to a little bit more a scale that one can understand as human beings, and I think that that culture shift to neighbors helps in the idea of collaboration. Collaborating in the abstract is sometimes tough. Collaborating when it's someone that I, I know who's right outside my doorstep, that's the basis that I've seen in, in local community organizing that uh, sometimes transcends uh, some of the more uh, large scale collaborations. Thank you so much. That's. That's a really interesting concept, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious to hear if, if for the audience has been following along, if, if, you know how this concept of, of working, creating together with your neighbors, and interacting with them is. Uh, what does that inspire, in, in terms of how you think about collaboration, the work, like what will help facilitate that as well? If you have thoughts, please feel free to leave us a question or comment in the Q and A panel. Um, Bree, last but not least. Yeah, thanks again. Um, yeah, so I think everyone really brought up some some good comments here. And I, I really also want to lift up what we were saying about creating a network of networks and community of communities. I think that's absolutely essential. And um, thank you, Nick, for bringing up the importance of interoperability again. I think even outside of the software realm, that's really important. Um, and related to incentives too. I, I do think as well that um, even in when we look at incentive structures within open science funding, you know, um, in our case, the open science harbor movement has grown significantly in the past decade, but we still see it excluded from a lot of open science projects and practices. Um, and a lot of the times we see a lot of the focus and a lot of the funding in open science initiatives that might go to outputs like publications or data rather than things like infrastructure, like hardware. Um, and so I do think that this is an important thing to be addressed within those incentive structures within open science. Um, and I really think one way that we can address these challenges is by creating policies and developing guidance um, for funding bodies, for researchers, and for federal agencies um, that really prioritizes the incorporation of open science infrastructure like hardware. Um, and one last comment that I did want to share related to this question is, um, I again, I'm going to bring up this focus on meaningful but also equitable collaboration. Um, when we do open science, it's important that we're avoiding the extractive research practices that historically has been an issue with institutions that are working with grassroots communities. Um, and in my experiences, the open science hardware movement, this global movement that I've been working with has provided a lot of insights into how meaningful um, collaboration looks uh, when we're working across regional and disciplinary boundaries. So yeah, that's all. That is a really, really important message. So thanks for bringing that to the fore. Yeah, indeed, um, it's, you know, everyone has, different privileges and powers. And it's really important to be conscious of how we are utilizing them um, and how they're showing up in the, the work that we do with each other and also within and beyond the communities. Um, all right, uh, we are at quarter, 15 minutes to the end of the session. So I do wanna make sure that we leave some time for the, our audience's question. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so uh, looking at our Q&A panel, um, there's a question on how do we think grassroots level input shape the initial stages of uh, research conceptualization? Um, how can researchers ensure that grassroots communities are not only involved, it, but also empowered uh, in the conceptualization phase of the research, thus contributing to a more equitable research process? Um, wondering if uh, any of you would like to start us off. It, I mean, part of it feels like there are certain efforts that are bas basically a direct response to this question, right? So there's certain open science practices that encourage people to share concept like currently conceptualized or infancy conceptualized research and get feedback on it, its process, how it should be done, what the topic is. I think there's a lot of different ways people are exploring this. And so I, I would... I would basically say that there's a lot of communities out there trying to practice different aspects of this. We actually have, um, we got a, a grant recently to host a civic science fellow in our organization. And this person is actually studying this exact question. So their research topic is basically how do we like better train or teach people to involve community input into their earliest research conceptualization? Super fun question. Um, but the answer when you go like dig into all of the literature that's out there is like there's lots of different ways that people have tried it and there's lots of different ways you could do it. You could get civic science or you could get like civic input on it. You could get researcher community input on it. You could get feedback on your process. You could get feedback on your questions. You could like source your research questions. You could like, there's all sorts of different ways to do it. And so uh, kind of to that point of interoperability, specialization that we talked about earlier, I would imagine there's lots of different groups, methods, or things that you could kind of like reach out to or engage in as a researcher to influence conceptualization. And I think it'll depend a lot on your project, the communities you're part of, which thing you want help on, or you feel like it could be influential to have help on in conceptualizing. Thank you so much for that, Nick. It's a beautiful example. Great. I think I might add to that as well. This question really made me think too of the importance of sharing as many aspects of the research process openly. Um, and when I'm thinking specifically about tools, um, when tools are closed source, it imposes a lot, a lot of limitations. If you have a question and want to collect data and you can't do that because the tool is closed source, it immediately kind of stops you in your tracks. Whereas when we are licensing things openly, we can share them within, you know, this sort of global knowledge commons and it becomes this shared resource that one person can contribute to and then be used in a completely different context. So I think when it comes to kind of conceptualizing these initial stages, um, if we create this shared knowledge commons and put information and resources into it, then anyone is able to access it and it can become this multi-directional sort of flow of resources and info that I mentioned earlier. So yeah, that's my my answer to that one. Thank you. Then. I don't know. I just want to say that um, this question actually made me, because it, my questions always bring us where we are our head is, um, it made me think of um, the, the importance of bringing and also something that, uh, sorry, Brie already said. So the importance of, of bringing the uh, input and, and you know, the, and having not just the input, but actually having the communities that are uh, at stakes and, and to, to empower them into um, shape what their research is. So I'm thinking about obviously like, uh, again, patients uh, being able to um, to be brought in at the early stage of their research um, um, because of sexualization. I'm thinking about um, a lot of research that to the day, to this day, it gets published um, with the data that was, um, so they're called like vampire projects, like data that was taken from communities without their consent, without their um, uh, explicit understanding of what was going to happen with that, with those samples. And um, all of that research has gone through peer review through multiple stages. So really understanding like, is there any input that came from the community in the design of this study at all? We've done some research with a 
um, um, and some work uh, in the context of uh, reproductive medicine and um, kind of uh, anti-racist practices in that context. And it was it was very clear that you know there are just there's a huge disconnect between what like the scientists at a high level are doing or like I know high level but like in their laboratory are doing and but they're working on real people and real policy suggestions that actually have a huge disconnect with the people that are going to affect. So this I don't know how. So I'm not answering the question, but I think with bringing more opportunities for groups of reviewers that are not the traditional experts that we're thinking about into bringing their input at earlier earlier stages of the research development. And we have projects that are going to come up soon to uh, uh, pilot some of these ideas all the way from the research um, kind of um, uh, conceptualization level to the uh, whatever final publication even as a mean. Uh, but I think that those are going to create these opportunities. But um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's going to be that soon, but I want to believe that in the next 10, 20 years, there's going to be more opportunities to, to do that uh, via grassroots and via also institutional support. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, it's about starting the conversation, right, and bringing everyone um, through. Um, Jacob. I love the concept and uh, of institutionalization. If you want, if we have a priority, if we have an institutional priority, like getting more people involved in the conceptualization of the research, and we want to make it a priority, build it into the office whose job it is to help build collaborations with community. Don't just give it as a mandate or a, a memo. Help give it staffing, give it resourcing, and make it a, available in terms of an office in order for that office to then experiment, maintain those relationships, learn what works and doesn't work, and then help the rest of the organization in, engage in that. So I, I, I'm all for institutionalizing uh, in order to be able to help achieve policy outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the sort of like operationalizing element and making sure that it is, you know, something not just we now have to do this because there is a policy, but also that it is given given the care, the resources that it needs to in order for, for it to move forward. It's, it's really, really important as well. Um, I'm trying to see, we probably have time to get to one more uh, audience question, which I think this one is, it's, it's sort of a little bit the elephant in the room, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, if I would be curious about how you're, how do you see your individual organization help motivate change in the incentive structure? Um, so feel free to you know unmute and start us off. Jacob, I see you're already ready. Oh, um, let me think about that one. How can uh, we motivate change? Um, also, plus plus has been uh, had some success in this in being really small. And having large impact by going and because of that that smallness, going and talking to people, going and talking to policymakers, going and talking to uh, as a small organization and with few people, um, you can talk to anyone, and th through that 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 way, you can really uh, affect change in a uh, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, but yeah, the and that and uh, having the United Nations help you out. Uh, and, and being able to work with the United Nations um, to be able to, 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 to then get the message out much wider in terms of, um, uh, of uh, changing those incentive structures by, by bringing, really bringing it to, to the top and the forefront and, and trying to build it as a nexus where we come together to talk about how to change those incentive structures. Yeah, absolutely. Collaborating also across with, with sort of international bodies and organization as well to help bring the message to the fore. It's really important. Maybe maybe this one's a little bit of a hot take, um, but I think it, sometimes you don't need to change incentive structures. Um, these structures exist, and sometimes what you can do is build a tool, build a method, uh, build a system that aligns along those existing incentive structures, right? So you, you, two different communities might have different sets of incentives, but if you can build something that somehow satisfies both of their incentives or both of their needs, then, but also achieves the outcome that you want, then like, great, you've solved it without changing incentive structures. 
maybe somebody views that as a changing of incentive structures because it results in a different outcome or something. So you're maximizing a different variable. I, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I think in some cases it's not necessary to, to change them. Um, for, for us, uh, the way that we do change incentive structures or focus on changing incentive structures is uh, really sort of like changing how or why people would contribute to open source materials, which is like the common problem of like open source questions in general, and has been a sort of challenge in open source education in general, which is like people basically just had to choose to do it out of the goodness of their hearts um, because generally people couldn't work on each other's materials very well. The open source education community has primarily been about resource sharing. Uh, so there's this database called Eric, for example, that's um, popular, where you basically like stick all your PDFs or your lesson plans, and then people can go like use them if they want. But everybody's using these custom learning management systems. So you have to like download those and put them into your learning management system. And so it was really hard. And you couldn't like edit other people's contributions to that database, so it was hard. And so the way we sort of like changed incentive structures is to like, okay, why would you contribute to open source education materials is, oh, well, now you get a DOI for like doing, uh, contributing to open source education materials. Uh, they're like, you can modify them and other people can modify them. And so you can contribute just a little snippet, but somebody can add on to it. And what you get back is a whole course plan, even though you only contributed a small lesson. And so now uh, these sort of like aligned with researchers like need for publishing and need for like verifiable contributions. Um, they aligned for educators needs where it's like they wanted to get back something from that community. They wanted to get back resources. They wanted people to modify their work and improve it over time. And so we were able to align incentives instead of changing them. The researchers still always had the incentive that they want credit for the work that they publish. The educators still always wanted to have somebody give critical feedback and help improve their lesson plans and to give them like free course materials and tutorials. And now they both get that, but it's done through this like new system. Thank you for that example. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Some a way to to a system in which you can actually align incentives, right? Because the incentive structure is not a you know there is not a one dimensional thing. Um, there's many different sort of perspectives and 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 desires, wishes, motivations within that, and it's finding the finding the ones that that you could sort of align with um, as well, and, and moving that sort of to the priority and to the fore. Um, uh, there's a uh, yeah Bree, please i noticed that we only have a couple minutes so i'm going to try to be as brief as i can um again as i mentioned earlier i think making sure there's incentives to fund things related to um, infrastructure like hardware and also the maintenance of this hardware is important um but i just want to also raise a comment as well that um as a community like I am not a research funder or a policymaker, but we can work with these adjacent communities and we are communities that have many people with many voices and we have people who are working on policy and research funding. And similar to what Nick was saying about adapting to these structures, um, these people, they have the knowledge, but they're also bound together by this shared interest and value in making open science hardware ubiquitous. So I think, especially for us in the GOSH community, what is most important with us is you know, working with adjacent communities and supporting other projects that can also benefit us as well and getting open science hardware in more places and lifting each other up. So that was my quick, like one minute answer to that. <laughs> Thanks, Brie. Danny, anything to add there last minute? I only want to say, I think that the way is by making them easy and resistible, they just need to do it, you know, to the community that you want. So I think that the so making it easy for that um, to be uptaken uh, by uh, people with different uh, different reasons why they get there, uh, you know, still prioritizing the, the the needs and expectation of communities that we we're focusing on. But like there are sort of so many angles that people can come to the same uh, goal, and so just like we focus on like easiness and making it um, uh, easy to be recognized and and um, and irresistible community to join because it's so fun to work together and um, and share with others and learn with one another.
Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there is a part of like natural instinct and incentive for us to to want to work together and to work in a more open way and a more collaborative way and to rely on each other and to to sustain each other and to be, de be dependent on each other, right? And I think the communities and grassroots initiatives that are here joining us today, thank you so so much. Uh, for for spending the time with us, but you've also really, really highlighted how communities can be so, so powerful in enabling us to not only do our work together better, but to really make science and research a better enterprise, if you will, a better environment and better better culture for us to all be part of. And those who are, you know, also not within that enterprise today, it could be welcoming for them. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. I hope it, this has been fruitful and um, and interesting and inspiring for y'all to go and look up these communities, join, maybe think about how you can contribute and be part of them and be excited about them. And for everyone uh, to, to, yeah, to spread the word and to tell everyone else about these wonderful opportunities and the work that they're doing as well. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much once again to Bree, Danny, Nick, and Jacob for your time and for all of you for listening in and uh, participating.